It's no secret what God can do. I, you believe that? That's nothing he cannot do. I'm thankful for that. What a great God we've got. And we had two good services yesterday. I'm praying we'll have another visitation tonight, the real presence of God. Are you wanting that? That's what revival is. It's us getting right with God in our individual lives. And then God says, well, if you do that, I'll, I'll visit with you. And do, do something in your life. It really will. So that's what I'm praying tonight will happen. We'll be attentive to worshiping him and glorifying him in, in, the, in our fellowship together. And then, of course, the singing and then the preaching of the word of God. Glad to have you here. <clears throat> Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful this evening for another wonderful day. Just to be alive on this planet Earth. We know, Lord, our time here is limited, uh, and eternity awaits us. And, Lord, <clears throat> we hunger for that day when our faith will be sight. We will see you. Oh, my. Oh, my. But, Lord Jesus, until then, there's so many who need to be saved. And some never heard. And, and dear God, so few doing anything about it. So I pray, Lord, tonight that you'll help us to be a, aware of your presence. <clears throat> May tonight's uh, service change us. Lord, if it's just in a small way, Lord, you'll change us and make us better than what we have been. Bless the choirs that sing, the congregation will sing. And, May you get honor and glory in it. In thy name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, what number we got? 490. 490. Let's stand, please. Amen. <laughs> thankful that the Lord does uh, uh, save and seeks after those that need to be saved. And I hope, pray tonight, if you're not saved, you'll take care of that tonight. He'll save you. If you let him, if you desire it, he'll save you. Be willing to repent of your sins. I don't like that word repentance, but that's what it's going to take. Amen. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going through Thursday night. I trust that you'll be praying and for each service this week, and you'll be here and bring somebody with you. Uh, it's good to have several visitors here tonight. We've got some preachers here. And we'll be meeting those in just a few moments and their wives. And appreciate a, a good day today. Got a lot accomplished in, in the office and doing some, had to order some stuff for Sunday school coming up. But uh, but Eddie and his wife got down safe and sound. And uh, what a blessing that was. All right. Well, let's see here. Brother Carl Baker, wave your hand over here. There he is. All right. And uh, here's his wife as well. We're in the end. All right, Miss Baker. They're having marital problems there today. Yeah, you come to get some help, amen. I, I know she got preachers in between you, good counsel there. Hey, that's the problem. Hey, that's the problem. <laughs> amen. Brother James Dukes, good having you tonight, amen. And his wife is right here, Miss Dukes, you raise your hand, okay. Brother Salazar, right here, you raise your hand, brother, and your wife right beside him, all right. All right, any other preachers here? Any other preachers here? Right, preacher? 
All right, Randy, it's good having you here tonight. What a blessing it is. Praise God. Uh, I want to give you something. church has a gift for all the preachers that come this week, and we want to uh, give you a nice gift. You will get it in the mail. We're going to mail it to you. But the caller said, what is it? I said, it's my power bill. <laughs> and uh, he said, I ain't bad. I said, wait, he gets my car payment. <laughs> so if you'll fill that out and put it in the offer plate later with a $100 bill, we'll take it. <laughs> and we'll give you 25 back. <laughs> no, just fill it out and put it in the offer plate. We do have a nice gift for you, and we'll, we'll mail it to you tomorrow, all right? Any other preachers here? Any other preachers here? All right. Well, praise God. How about you other visitors? Just raise your hand up real high. We want to see you. All the other visitors here, lift it up real high. There you go. Good to have you here tonight. Thank God for that. Now, Thursday night, even though it's the last night of the meeting, is pack a pew night. We've never done this before that I recall. And we had 10 people, so they're going to pack a pew. Amen. So uh, I hope you'll get them here before Thursday night. Because what's going to happen, they're going to get here Thursday night, and they're going to say, why don't you invite me on Monday or Tuesday night? All right? So we're looking forward to tonight night. And uh, all right, we do have a nursery if you need it, ladies. It's right down the end of the hallway where the water fountain is. Take a left at the water fountain. First door on your right. The restroom's right there before you get to the water fountain if you need to use the restroom. If you have a cell phone, <clears throat> like I have in my pocket, you need to do something with it right now. I don't mean cut it wide open either. Okay, I did, I, last night I preached the entire message with my cell phone on. I said, wouldn't that be something, somebody text me something or call, give me a phone call? My wife said, what would you do? I said, I'd answer it. Say, don't you know you're interrupting me? <laughs> all right, take care of that business, all right? But anyway, we're just tickled to death to have you here, and I uh, hope you'll just let the Lord speak to your heart. Let's have another congregation song. Amen. Amen. All right, you can remain seated on this one, page 281. Jesus saves. Amen. 281. thinking about the revival this week and what we're planning on doing. You know, I was, uh, told the church yesterday, I said, you know, to really have a real revival takes more than four days. If you have a real revival, it'll probably take a week, ten days, two weeks, just for God's people to get lined up, tuned up with the Lord. I believe it. But I believe we can have a touch of it and have, have a, a revival in our heart and our souls in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, maybe a small way, but to have a real revival that would impact the whole church and the community, the surrounding areas, it really takes a great deal. And uh, 
sing above the battle strife. You don't think the Christian life's not a battle? I'm telling you what, it's a battle. It really is. But I'm glad we got a great commander. And he, he, he knows no defeat. He's, he's, never be, he's never even come close to defeat. You know that? He's never even been scored on. He's undefeated. And he's my captain. <laughs> and uh, he, knows, he, knows, he knows the way to go. Amen. All right. Just thank the Lord. I, I preached last night on that, on that, uh, that storm in the book of Acts and uh, what all transpired as a result of it and how we go through storms. And you may be going through one tonight. Uh, or just come out of one. But I'm glad we got a great we got a great storm stopper, or somebody who can take us through the storm and watch over us while we're in it. Amen. All right, the choir's gonna sing a couple for us. Listen very carefully.
Them speak to some folks right around you there. Shake in uh, with your neighbor. get our seats. Everybody get a seat. <laughs> there you go. Amen. Well, I'm glad I'm saved. Uh, I'll never ever be able to be condemned again in God's eyes. All my sins are washed away. That's no license to sin. As a matter of fact, you will sin after you get saved. And that sin can damage your testimony, hurt your walk with God, rob you of the power of God, cause God to put a spanking on you. So sin still has its consequences, but I'm glad I'm, I'm, glad I'm saved and never have to worry about, about the lake of fire. Amen. Oh, boy. Didn't know that when I first got saved. I just knew I got saved and didn't know much about the Bible. And uh, but I, the more the longer I the more I read that book, the more I realized I am really super duper saved. Not, not super duper saved. Amen.
Amen. Wonderful Savior. All right. Amen. Well, Brother Tommy Lamb's going to come and sing a song for us. Appreciate Brother Tommy always been on, 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 on duty, on call, I might say. All right. Be awful quiet tonight. Is it, are these visitors got you nervous? Got you nervous, Tom? All you visitors just leave. No, I don't mean that. You visitors pray for him, okay? All right. Sing a song for us, Brother Tom. So, Brother Eddie's been coming for several, several years to Welch Creek Baptist Church, and he's been my friend, and I appreciate him. And uh, the song was the theme of our camp meeting here. Um, why preach? Let's listen to the words. his Bible as so many times before confident he'd given all God had laid at his heart's door all the prayer and preparation all the faces that he saw surely God would help them if upon him they would call as the invitation lingered, his heart was torn in twain. He knew that God wished to move, but sadly no one came. So why preach when no one seems to care? They're too busy now for prayer. And they won't repent of sin. Why preach when it all seems in vain? Because the people just won't change. I feel like giving up. So why preach? Saying, preacher, may I have a word? See, I was a nobody and headed nowhere fast till you came and told me of the Savior's love. You said he died for my sins when I was yet in them. If I trust him, he could make my life brand new. And since I've called on his name, thank God I haven't been the same. And I found him to be faithful and true. I was one the people said could not. So if you ever need a reason to preach, let it be me. And then from across the church, a young lady stood up. Pastor, may I also testify? You see, I was raised in this church, and I know all the right words, and I can quote that King James Bible verse for verse. Last week you preached on the cross. God let me see that I was lost. 
now I stand here redeemed, forgiven, free. And I know that there are others besides me. So if you ever need a reason to preach, let it be me. One by one they stood proclaiming all the victories God gave. God let that dear old preacher know that his work was not in vain. So go preach when no one seems to care and they have no time for prayer and they won't repent of sin. in vain cause the people just won't change when you feel like you're giving up there are millions upon millions left to reach so if you ever need a reason to preach let it telling our people the things that our churches need the most and our country needs the most we're not getting enough of we need more preaching we need more church I don't mean entertainment I don't mean all the things that churches are doing today calling it preaching but we really need some preaching today and more of it and uh, and we're getting less of it we really are thank you brother Tommy Real, real blessing to my heart. I don't know. I don't know what you got picked out for fix and change. Okay. I've I've been humming this song today, most of the day, and uh, it's 423 in your hymn book. And we're going to sing it and receive tonight's offering. Oh, we're not going to take an offering tonight. For the Eddie's pastor, he don't need a love offering. So we're. Uh, He's, he's took a church, and I think they paid him like $3,000 a week. So, uh, Eddie, could you send us a love offering? Help out visiting evangelists that's coming through next week. <laughs> he knows I'm teasing, but uh, no, we always want to help the men of God, pastors and everybody. But Eddie has taken a church, and he uh been coming here 19 years. And I think you said it's the first church had a revival in. And 19 years ago, every January, I think he missed one January, he had some, had some surgery on his teeth and his gums, and and uh, I think that's the only year he missed. And I'll say more about that later. But this song here really has been on my heart today. I said I've been humming it because I really can't sing it, but I can hum it. All right? And we're going to sing all three verses of 423. We'll stand, and we'll receive the offering for our ministry preacher. <laughs>
you get. Glad he cares for you. Every day. Every day. He comes to me with new assurance. More and more. I understand his words of love. And I'll never know just why he came to save me. I like this. Till someday I see his blessed face above. Oh boy. Nobody quite like the Lord, is he? He's, he's like Isaiah said. He's just wonderful in every way possible. Amen. Uh, so what you give tonight and the rest of the week you go to our visit preacher. Pray you'll give what God tells you to give. Amen. That's all that matters. All right. Uh, Brother Carl, would you ask God to bless the offering? Bless the preacher. Yes. Yes, God. Yes. Oh, God. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, God. Yes. Oh, God, yes. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Help us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen.
Jesus is the lighthouse. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's get your Bibles out, sit up straight, and pay attention on purpose. Before Brother Eddie comes, he can make his way up here, though. I want you to come on up, Brother Eddie. Brother Salazar, how long have you been pastoring at the church you're at now? 28 years, right over close to the Santee area. I believe it's still over in that neck of the woods. 28 years. Brother Baker, how long have you been down in Beaufort? Three more weeks, 39 years. Amen, amen. And Brother Dukes, are you passing anywhere now? But you've been preaching how long, though? 100 years? <laughs> yeah, not that many years. A good many years. Somebody told me about that Brother Dukes and Brother Alfred and some bird fellow was the cut-ups back in their younger days before they all got saved. I won't tell you, but he's here tonight that told me that. <laughs> Sitting close to the front, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, you ready for some preaching? Uh, I tell you what, I sure am. I need preaching. I really do. I need preaching. Brother Ed, it's good having you back. Sister Ron, it's good to have you with him. Amen. I like that. So, preacher, Thank you, God preacher. bless you. We'll be praying for you. Bless you. Amen. You pray for him. Well, what a joy it is to be able to gather tonight. Something different and special about this service. I don't know exactly what it is, but there's just been a special touch on the choir singing, the music. Even some of the things Brother Baker said made sense. <laughs> and it's just, it's special. And I thank the Lord for it. It's a joy for us to be back. I'm always reminded when I walk behind this podium that this is the first church I preached in as an evangelist. The first revival that I ever preached. And you took me on for support that morning. And uh, for 19 years you've been faithful. And I want to thank you. I, I want to thank you for your faithfulness to us down through these many years. God has assigned us uh, to the pastorate of the Liberty Baptist Church in Crossville, Tennessee. There's probably been, and I'd be safe to say, 30 churches over the 19 years of evangelism that have approached me or called me about considering the pastorate. <coughs> And uh, I would immediately say no, because I knew I was doing what God had for me to do. And uh, for the past couple of years, God's really been working in my heart. And I've preached in three, uh, three different churches, and uh, I didn't say no, but God said no. And so when I went into the Liberty Baptist Church the first Sunday of December of last year, uh, I was listening for the no, and uh, God didn't say no. And the men talked to me after the service. I didn't know them. They didn't know me. That's the first time we'd ever met. And uh, he said, Preacher, would you please pray? He said, we've been without a pastor since July. We haven't even looked for one. We don't think sheep have the ability to select a shepherd. That's what they told me. And said, we've been waiting on God to send us one. And I said, I'll pray. And that week in prayer, God took the burden of evangelism out and put that little nucleus of about 40 folk in my soul. And I'm like a kid with a new toy. <laughs> and somebody said, Preacher, that is the most foolish step I've ever heard. The end of October last year, I'm sorry, the end of November last year, I filled up 2019's calendar. 2019 in evangelism. And God said, I want you to pastor this church. And... Uh, so God does give redirection sometimes. And I want to be usable to him. The men told me, the men told me, the church, they said, Brother Davis, and I said, I have obligations that I have got to take care of here until I can get some, uh, some kind of uh, system set up. 
I said, this is new to me, and they said, we understand that the ministry God's given you is not to be confined to one congregation. We're behind you 100%, whatever God tells you to do. And that was a great plus. And so I will be preaching some out, but not every week like I have been doing for 19 years. And Brother Dukes, the real blessing of being able to be there, and the church is only about 22 miles from my house. And uh, for the first time in many years, all of my family gets to go to church together again. Amen. And uh, good, I bless the Lord for Amen. that. I thank God for it. I really think what God did is that he answered the prayers of my daughter. I really do. My daughter told me, she said, Daddy, I said, under your ministry for years, in the pastorate, and she said, I cannot get used to anything else. Said, uh, you will pastor. That's what she said. You will pastor. She said, I've asked God. And uh, so the Lord answered her prayer. I love you, church. I thank God for you. I appreciate you so much. <clears throat> I want us to open our Bibles to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter number 6. You'll find that Mark pictures the Lord as the servant of God. Matthew shows him as king, Luke as the son of man, John as the son of God. Somebody said, Preacher, why do we need four different men's accounts of the same individual? Well, it's sort of like flipping through a photo album. You get different snapshots of the same person. And certainly it does reveal every facet of him. And uh, uh, Mark's account is the gospel of the servant who came to, to minister, not to be ministered to, but to minister. And you'll find in Mark's account that there's, there's more of the movings of God. There's more of the words such as straightway, anon, immediately. You find those words in Mark's account more than all of the others put together. And for the simple reason it is that there's, it's from one episode right into another. Because there's no rest for a servant. No rest for a servant. And he's being portrayed as the servant. And there's no rest for a servant. And so Mark chapter 6 is, uh, is no different. You'll find in the first part of the chapter that he is, uh, uh, they're, they're trying to figure out how the son of a carpenter could do what this man's doing. The only problem is he's not the son of a carpenter, but he is a good carpenter. He was a good carpenter then. He's a good carpenter now. He's building a work, and he's fixing things. Amen. And then you come to verse number 7 and following, and you find that he calls his disciples and sends them out two by two. And then Herod in verse number 14, Herod hears of the message of Jesus. And it's the same message that John Baptist preached. Now, I don't know if Herod believed in resurrection or reincarnation. All he knows is he thinks John Baptist is back. And he don't want nothing else to do with that. He's already cut his head off once. And uh, he, he don't want to deal with this. He thinks John Baptist is being reincarnated. But I thought about how that the ministry of Jesus was mistaken by Herod for John. What a testimony for John. Amen. Praise God. What a testimony for John Baptist that they thought that he was Jesus and that Jesus was him. That's being conformed, is it not? Then we come to verse 30. Verse number 30, we find that the Lord takes his disciples apart for a little rest. 
And, uh, of course, uh, they didn't get to rest, but I don't think the Lord is against uh, coming apart to rest. Well, I think he's certainly against making a career out of it. <laughs> but I don't think that he's against us resting. And But in the process of that, there's a multitude that resorts to them. And it's late in the day. He teaches them and they have nothing to eat. And if it hadn't been for John's account of the feeding of the 5,000, we wouldn't have known there's a little lad involved. John's the only one that mentions the little boy with the lunch. But he took that lunch and he fed that multitude. Well, verse number 45, he constrains his disciples to get into a ship and to go to the other side. Can you see the immediate uh, episodes here, just one right after the other? No, not even time to breathe. Even when they took time to rest, they couldn't. And uh, they, he sends them to the other side, and he himself goes into the mountain to pray. And in their journey, from where they were to where they were going, they encountered this storm. I want to say from where we began to where we're going, we're going to encounter storms. And the storm was a terrible storm, which brings me now to my thought. That storm, they, they had no idea what was going to happen. Jesus comes walking to them on the water and gets in their boat. And the Bible says in verse 51, and he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were so amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. Verse 52 is my thought. The reason they were so uh, afraid and scared is because the Bible said, For they considered not the miracle of the loaves. For their hearts, their heart was hardened. I got the, the, the Bible said here the reason that they nearly came apart in the storm is because they had forgotten what the Lord had done yesterday. And I want to preach tonight on the importance of considering the loaves or the importance of of not forgetting in your difficulties what God has done for you previously. Has God ever done anything good for anybody in here? I tell you, he's been good to us, has he not? But there's going to be difficult times that may shadow or seemingly separate you from his presence. But what would get you through? And what will keep your heart from becoming hard is to remember what he's done for you previously. Let's ask God that he may help us. Father, thank you for the privilege you've given us together tonight in the house of the Lord. I sense a, something special about this. Lord, I don't know what you have in store for us. I have no idea, but I do know you have a divine distance you want to carry us to. And I pray, God, that you can get us there. And, Lord, I know it'll be a greener pasture. I pray, Father, that you would bless. Have your will in your way. Help us to be as brief as possible. But to say everything that you won't say tonight, I pray, God, that you'd work in the hearts of the unsaved and bring them unto the acknowledgement of yourself by the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. Have your way now tonight, and for whatever is accomplished, you will get all glory for it. For it's in Jesus' wonderful and precious name we pray, amen. Now, Jesus that tells us there the reason their hearts were hard is that they had not considered the miracle of the loaves. Let me say something, a hard heart, is the type of heart you do not want. A hard heart is an unreceptive heart. 
A hard heart is an unresponsive heart. The only thing you can do with a hard heart is to break it. You can't sow anything in it. You can't mold it and make it in, in, in any way. When a heart becomes hard, the only way that it can be worked on is to be broken. And the reason we do not need a hard heart is that we don't need God. We don't want God to break our hearts. I'm telling you, friend, there is such a thing as going through the difficulties of life and your heart not become hard. I thought about there in Mark chapter 8. If you'll go over there, we'll just lay a little groundwork here for a moment. In Mark chapter 8, it's nearly a prelude, uh, or, or not a prelude, but it's an after effect maybe a deja vu of chapter number 6. Matter of fact, you will find that Jesus feeds 4,000. And, and then he constrains his disciples to get into a ship again. And some are saying, oh no, we just went through this uh, just a few weeks ago. You know why God did that? Because, listen, whenever you're walking with God, God, you know what God did? God had tested them and then uh, he had taught them when he fed the 5,000. But he tested them in the storm. Can I tell you, there's always comes testing after being taught. And if you hadn't been paying any attention when you're being taught, there's a possibility you'll fail the test. But I'm telling you, friend, have one thing about when you get in the school of God, when you fail test, he don't expel you. He just takes you back and makes you take it over again. If we can ever learn to pass a few tests, we can move on for the glory of God. Amen. But I'm finding here in chapter number 8, he put them in, he fed the 4,000. If you will notice, it always gets smaller. It's best uh, to let God teach us from the very beginning. Oh, I don't have time to deal with that. But I'm just saying here, he fed them. He put them on a ship and headed them uh, to the other side. But this time, he's on the ship with them. Look, if you will, in verse number 14 of chapter 8. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among them saying, Is it because we have no bread? Is he teaching us? Is he saying this because we forgot to bring bread? Oh, look at it. Bible said here, verse 17, and when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, why reason ye? Because you have no bread. You know what he said? Hey, how many times have I got to prove to you we can get bread when there ain't no bread? But he said here, he said, he said, perceive ye not yet, neither understand, have ye your heart yet hardened? He said, boys, I can't hardly believe after the last month of you walking with me and watching me do the impossible and supplying the need, I cannot believe that you're still with a hardened heart. You know what that tells me? A hardened heart will keep you from believing that God can. Hey, God can, hallelujah. But a hard heart will keep him from operating in your behalf. Now, they, he said in verse 18, Having eyes, see you not? And having ears, hear you not? Do you not remember? When I break the five loaves among 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? They say unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among 4,000, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? And they said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that you do not understand? 
Oh, that, but listen, but let me say, before we jump on those boys for being full of unbelief, let's just uh, take our own self-test. How many times have you and I run into a hard place and uh, into a difficult place and God's taken care of us back under years ago and now we run into another and we begin to say, oh God, what are we going to do now? I tell you what we'll do. We'll just believe the same God that took care of us back there is going to take care of us now. Amen. Amen. Church, if you're not real careful, you'll look behind you and become discouraged with the future. Whoa, well, look what's going on. What's happening? Now, I have no idea. I'm just a preaching. But I'm just simply saying, well, look. I want to tell you, friend, the same God that set sail, set us sailing toward home, it's the same God that's going to get us there. I'm telling you, stay with God and believe God, and God will see you through. Well, Lord, help me to hurry now. Help me to hurry. Miss Sherry wants me to hurry, and I'm going to hurry. We see, we see here that. They had developed a hard heart. Now, there, as I look at this, there's uh, different, kind, different types of hearts that's mentioned in the Bible. As a matter of fact, there are those in the Word of God that had heavy hearts, but your heart can be heavy and not be hard. There are those that had fearful hearts. You can have a fearful heart and it not be a hard heart. There were those in the Bible that had longing hearts. It was said about David that he had a large heart. Uh, those two Emmaus disciples ended up with burning hearts. Uh, the Bible talks about in Jeremiah and Ezekiel about a new heart and a pure heart. But none of those have to become hard. Now, uh, how do you, what preacher... It's right for circumstances to harden your heart. You know what Job said in chapter 23? Let me say this. I don't know what your difficulties are and what they've been, but they ain't none of us went through what Job went through. And as it was said about Elijah, we could say it about Job. He wasn't a superhuman. He was a man of like passion just like you and I. He hurt. He felt. Do you know what he said in chapter 23? <laughs> he said in verse 16, For God maketh my heart soft. <laughs> I'm telling you, somebody said, well, enough difficulties will make anybody's heart hard. I'm going to tell you, friend, you study the life of Job and the situation of Job and Job's difficulty never did harden his heart. The more God worked on him, the softer it became. I'm telling you, friend, and a soft heart, a soft heart can continue to remain moldable in the hands of our heavenly potter. Now, having said that, let me say this couple of things that will be done. Uh, if these fellows have developed a hard heart, if their hearts are hard, let's see what they came through to cause it. In other words, let's look at the course for a hard heart. When did it start? I can assure you, yesterday, when the sun set, and they got on board that ship, there wasn't a one of them had a hard heart. Matter of fact, they had been involved in feeding that multitude with the miracle of the Lord. And you would have never made them believe that there was anything ever impossible with the Lord. All of them had a heart that was receptive and responsible when they boarded ship. But, but before sun comes up in the morning, every one of them developed a hard heart. What that tells me, don't take long to do it. <laughs> Doesn't take long to cause your heart to get hard. It may take longer to get it repaired than it did to mess it up. Oh, 
God help us tonight. I sent a little preach here. Listen to me, church. And I want to preach to the church as a whole and then individual families and then individual. I don't know what your situations may have been, what you've been going through. I don't know. But I can tell you, do not allow it to harden your heart. You'll get in trouble with the Lord. We see the course for the hard heart. First of all, this is very elementary. I see the trial. The very, what began, the heart of their heart was the trial that they encountered. The trial was the storm. Now, notice with me the position of the ship. Verse number 47 of chapter 6 of Mark. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea. You know when the storm hit? The storm hit when there wasn't any other place to go. Listen very carefully. As long as the ship is docked on shore, you can jump off of the ship run down the shore and get on another ship that's docked on shore. <laughs> but ships are not made to stay docked on the shore. Storms normally don't bother ships that's never set sail. There's a lot of buildings with steeples on them that's never launched out into the deep. And let me say this, whenever you leave the ship, you can be assured that you are in shallow water and run down the shore and get on another ship, you can be assured there in shallow water. But the storm hit when they had left the shore. Brother Baker, they were now Sailing the life of faith. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying the storm hit when there was nowhere else to go. The real life of faith comes when you stick with a ship regardless of how strong the storm is. Somebody said, well, I'm just waiting on a, a few more to leave, and then I'll leave. You better be careful about leaving when a ship is set sail. You may drown when you exit. That is right. And I'm telling you, somebody said, well, now, wait a minute, preacher. Simon, this is the same storm where Simon Peter got out of the boat. Yeah. Boy, I've heard a lot of preaching. I don't want to, don't throw nothing at me now. But I've heard a lot of preaching on why it's right to get out of the boat. So I said, well, the Lord told him to. The Lord told Simon to get out of the boat to teach us not to. Why, preacher? Listen, Simon was the only one in that crowd that sang. Those that stayed in the boat never started down. You say, what are you saying? I'm saying to you, when the storms are raging, don't get out of the boat. Stay in the boat. Well, we can probably rip up a few outlines there, but hey, I'm just, I'm just a, if you want to preach it's right to get out of the boat, help yourself. But I'm just simply saying, the Lord said to Simon Peter, Simon Peter said, Lord, if it be thou, if it be thou, if it be thou, bid me come. He's a teaching Simon Peter. You don't ever question the Lord if it's you or not. What do you mean, preacher, if it was him? Who else could have been walking on the water? I mean, you see somebody coming walking across the water and you ask them who it is. 
Who else can it have been? It had to be him. So we see that, that, that the faithless a lot of times will get out of the boat. If it hadn't been for the mercies of the Lord, they, Simon Peter would have drowned right there. The reason the Lord didn't let him drown, he knew there was a Pentecost coming. Amen. That's why he got him back. But you know what he did when he got him back? He headed back to the ship. Praise God. He said, Simon Peter, the safest place for you when the storm's raging is in the ship. Help. Did you know, listen to me, the only stability and the only foundation you have in the storm is in the ship. Oh my. That's the only stability. That's the only solid place you've got is the ship when it's in the midst of the sea, when the storm's raging. Y'all getting any of this? What am I supposed to do, preacher? Stay at the ship. The Lord puts you on it. Don't get off of it. There's the position of the ship. It was in the midst of the sea. Just as far to the left as it was to the right. They had just as far to go as they had come. The right in the middle of the sea and the storm hit. Teaching us stick with the boat. Stay in the ship. As a matter of fact, when the storms are raging, it's the best not to hang around on the border. Get, it, get in on the inside. It's close to the middle as you can get. <laughs> oh, God help us. I see the position of the ship and then I see the position of the Savior. Where's the Lord? Well the Bible said in verse number 47 the end phrase says and he alone on the land. Now you know commentators are strange fellas. I read some commentator you've heard me say this a hundred times I guess. I'll say it again. Some commentators that's what you find out they are. Just common taters. <laughs> and they said, some of them said, there had to be a discrepancy and an error in the Bible because there's no way that Jesus could have been alone on the land. <laughs> that they, and they go through this spill. There had to be others on the land. Well, how dumb is that? We know there's others on the land, but the one, the only ones that the Lord's interested in is them out there under in the midst of the storm. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! And, 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 the, and the Holy Ghost here, what it's saying to us is that the Lord is alone on the land and you're in the storm. He's not preoccupied with everything else. He's alone on the, on the land with his eye on you. He's not letting anybody else or anything else uh, detour uh, his gaze and his attention. His eye is on you. Praise God. You look at those boys looked around in the storm and Jesus wasn't even nowhere to be found. But there's one thing for sure. They may not have known where he was. Praise God, he knew where they were. They might have been looking for him and couldn't see him for the storm. But the storm didn't affect him seeing them. Woo! I'm telling you, he knows where we are. Lord, help me to hurry now. I see... In the course for this hard heart, I see the trial. Then I want you to get this. If you missed everything else there, I want you to get this. Not only the trial, but the toiling. Notice what the Bible says in verse 48. And he saw them toiling in rowing. Now listen carefully here. How do you make a ship go forward? You row. So they're going to the other side. Rowing 
is right. But you know what? The storm has made them tired of doing right. Tired of doing right. They were toiling in what had brought them this far. They were toiling now in the correct way to make a ship go forward. They were tiring of doing right. Brother James... As I've watched this across the country in 19 years from coast to coast, preaching nearly every, if I got a night off, I'd have to book it off a year in advance. I'm just telling you, I know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm seeing that's a great danger among the good churches of America? It's folk are getting tired of doing right. They are toiling in rowing. But you see, Brother Whitman, previously they were rowing to go forward. They were rowing to go forward. The way they got from where they were to where they are, they have rowed, headed to the other shore. But now, the wind has turned on them. I'd be safe to say that when they got on board back there on the shore and they set sail, the breeze was with them. And boy, it's a lot easier to row when you got the breeze going with you. It's much easier to row. And you know the analogy there, the wind's a type of the Holy Ghost. It's much easier. It's a lot easier to do right when there's no opposition. <clears throat> That's right. It's a lot easier to keep doing right when every stroke is making big strides. But now the wind's turned. And I preach sometimes on when the Holy Ghost brings a negative work in the church. Somebody said he's always positive. Let me say a word. God does some negative works. Why in the world do we even ever have a winter time anyhow? Why not just let why not? Why not just let it be spring and summer all the time? Wouldn't be ha we be happy? No, mosquitoes would get as big as helicopters and carry us off. <laughs> God sends the winter time to do a negative work to kill out that stuff that would keep us from having a harvest when harvest time comes. Sometimes God does a negative work in your church. In other words, the wind blows contrary to you. And now it's hard to row when the wind is contrary to you. But listen carefully right here. Don't miss this. They're not rowing now to go forward. They're rowing now to keep from going back. The wind's blowing. Oh, it's much easier to row to go forward than it is to row to keep from going back. Y'all getting this? Oh, but preacher, we've always went forward. Yeah, but if you'll just do what's right when the storms are raging, you may get tired of doing it, but could I say this? Before they give plumb out, Jesus come and got on board. You just keep doing right. You just keep on rowing. You just keep on doing right. The Lord sees you. He knows where you are. You just keep on doing right. Even though you may not be going forward, at least you ain't going back. Hallelujah. You keep on doing right and keep on rowing. Just keep on rowing, church. Keep on doing right. You know where these fellows are? Lord, I gotta, I gotta hurry now. I'm about done. I'll, I'll skip the most of this. They, they's preaching here tonight. I'm telling you. Do you know where these men are? In that ship, 
they're stuck. I think I might have dealt with this last year when I was preaching on Noah. But uh, somebody said, you can't get stuck in the middle of the sea. Well, when you get to have mass these boys, if you can get stuck in the middle of the sea. They're stuck. Well, preacher, is it ever right to be stuck? Well, Noah got stuck. Noah was in the ark 370 days. It's a long time to be in the ark. And he was moving 150 days. That's why in Noah's account, day, all these days are, are precise. He was moving 150 days and then God stuck him on Mount Ariak and left him 220 days. So he is stuck long when he is moving in the will of God. You know why God stuck him? To keep him from getting stuck. Why, preacher? Because with a storm like Noah had, you're going to have a lot of mud involved. And God stuck him in the ark to keep him from getting out of the ark and getting stuck in the mud. There's been a lot of folk that's kicked out of the ark, kicked out of the will of God too soon, and now they're stuck in the mud. How do you know, preacher? Because all they're doing is slinging mud. You don't have to be around them long or you'll get what they've got all over them, all over you. Stuck in the mud. And he who slings mud loses ground. But he's, he's stuck. Could I say it like this? I'd rather be stuck and not moving in the will of God than I would be to be stuck out of the will of God. Somebody said, preacher, it seems like down at the church, it seems like that we just sort of been stuck. Now this don't work at the sword conference. This preaching like this don't work about the negative work of the Holy Ghost. They're all time saying if you ain't got a dozen walking the altars every week, you can't be in the will of God. Only thing wrong with that is there ain't no Bible to back that up. Thank you. And Noah stuck. God put him on that boat back yonder, said come in, and he got on it without a steering wheel. Noah's ark didn't have no steering wheel called. Why? Because you can't drive in a storm like that. And he's not, he don't know where he's going anyway. All he knows, oh glory, all Noah knows that he's following God, God's going to take him to a higher plane than he's ever been before. So what God does is send a storm that destroys everything else, but it puts Noah on a higher plane than he's ever been. Somebody said, preacher, I feel like I'm stuck. When you do exit out, you'll probably be higher with him than you've ever been. Stay with God. That ark didn't have no stern or bow. Didn't have no front or back. No, it didn't know if he's coming or going. But there's an unseen hand. In the midst of that storm, that's a maneuvering that ark to a higher plane and stuck him there and wouldn't let him out. Listen carefully, and I'm moving on. Listen carefully. Sometimes the after effects of the storm takes longer to get over than the storm itself. The storm was oh, the storm only lasted 40 days. 
Storm only lasted 40 days. For 330 more days was the after effects. The cleaning up the mess the storm left takes longer than the storm itself. Well, preacher, the storm's over, the suns are shining, the storm's over, but we're still not making progress. God's drying up the ground so that when he does let you out, you won't have to spend no time raking mud. You can just start planting. <laughs> and that's what Noah did. Oh, there's too much to say here. Oh, God, help us, church. God, help us. Don't let your heart get hard. <laughs> There's the course for a hard heart. There's the consequences of a hard heart. And I've done mention this. There's no certainty. There, when your heart's hard, there's no certainty about anything. Because, uh, and I've done mention it, but the Bible said in there, verse number 49, but when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed. Well, like I said, who else could it have been? But a hard heart, a hard heart can't, can't, can't get a glimpse of the supernatural. Wow. A hard heart is stuck in his own carnal reasoning. And when you do see the impossible, you can't believe it because your heart's hard. There's no certainty. And then a hard heart has no cheer because the Bible said when the Lord showed up, uh, verse 50, for they all saw him and were troubled. The presence of the Lord troubles a hard heart. How about that? The presence of the Lord troubles a heart that's hard. But Lastly, briefly, there's the course for a hard heart, there's the consequences of a hard heart, but then there's the cure for a hard heart. The cure is he's aware of their position. He saw them toiling and rowing. Verse number 48, he saw them toiling and rowing. He arrives with his presence. He says, it is I, be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid, and in the presence of the Lord there's fullness of joy. <laughs> and, he, and, and, and he answers with this proclamation, fear not, be not afraid, it's I, it's I. Now, I've mentioned this, Brother Baker, here, I know I have. Maybe to just refresh the memory of some, but help others. Uh, when Jesus, yesterday now, yesterday he's fed approximately 15 to 20,000, 5,000 men besides the women and children. And most of the time kids can eat more than men. So there's approximately 15,000 or more. And the Lord fed them. And the Bible said that they took up how many baskets full of fragments? Twelve. You ever wonder where they got the basket? I mean, who's going to carry around an empty basket? It's late in the day. They've been out there all day. Where did the basket come from? Well, preacher, it's just, it, it just it, it, there's nothing in this Bible without a reason. They took up 12 baskets full. And uh, I personally think, and I'll have to wait till we get to heaven to see whether I'm right or wrong, but I, he's never rebuked me for preaching this, for mentioning it anyway, because it's a help. I believe that morning when that little lad headed to the Lord, to hear the Lord, uh, his mama put his 
five little loaves and two fishes in a little basket. He had to have something carried in. And it wasn't all squashed up <clears throat> at the end of that day. So he was carrying something. I think it was a basket. And I, and I believe that when Jesus asked if there was anything available, Andrew said, well, there is a lad here. He's got five loaves and two fishes. He said, bring them hither to me. And they... Let's just say they brought the five loaves and two fishes to the Lord in that basket. The Lord takes the five loaves and two fishes out. He breaks them and he blesses them. Then the Bible said he gave to the disciples. How many disciples were there? <laughs> he dropped them loaves and fishes back in there that he'd blessed and he gave Matthew a basket. And he gave John a basket. He gave Thomas a basket. He gave Judas a basket. You say, oh, preacher, I don't believe that. He couldn't do that. Look good at this. If he can make, if he can feed that multitude of five loaves and two fishes, he ain't got no problem of getting 11 more baskets out of one. And he just gives them all a basket. Because it's late in the evening. And just think about it. How do you suppose that those disciples, Jesus actually didn't feed the multitude. He just blessed it. The disciples fed the multitude. You don't think they kept running back and forth to him, getting little handfuls in hand. Look, there's a multitude, a field full of people. They couldn't keep running back and forth, back and forth, getting little handfuls from the... I believe he just gave them all a basket. The Bible says they had them to sit down all in order. And he takes that, and I, and I believe they take their basket. And them folk reach in there. I don't know if they reached in or if they handed them, but all I know is when they got done, everybody was full. I'd be safe to say that old brother Thomas, after he had fed his 941st one, he looked in there and the basket was still full. And he's saying, I ain't believing it. Because the Bible said when everybody ate, Brother Raymond, when everybody was filled, notice the wording. They did not pick up 12 basketfuls of fragments that remained. The Bible said they took up 12 basketfuls of fragments that remained. You don't think, the, you don't think Jesus was going to let his disciples eat out of that that had dropped out of their hands and fell out of their mouth and they go around picking up the fragments that remain. That's unsanitary. The Lord ain't got nothing to do with that. I just believe when they fed the whole multitude, they looked in the basket and it was still full. And so they, that word took up means that each one of those men took up a basket full of fragments that remained in the basket. That's the way the Lord does stuff, you see. Well, if I've got a basket, like I said all of that to say this, if I've got a basket like that, I ain't leaving it. I'm not leaving it behind. When the Lord tells me to get on the ship, I'm taking my basket with me. I'm taking it with me. I'm not leaving a basket like that laying around. It's going with me. I'm going to take it up and go with it. And I believe, Brother Joe Ben, when they got on that ship and when they shoved off and the breeze was blowing and they was headed to the other side, probably Simon Peter reached over there and flipped the lid open on that basket Wow, John, get you a bite of that. That's about it. Get you something out of your basket. That's about as good as I've ever ate. Get you a bite of it. And they're probably eating out of their basket while the wind is, the breeze is blowing toward home. 
But the storm hit. The storm hit. The storm hit. And the ship is a reel and then a rock and, and their baskets slide somewhere out of sight. But it's still there. Church, when the storm hits, ma'am, sir, in your situation, when the storm hits, instead of developing a hard heart, feel around in the midst of that storm and find that basket and drag it back over here and get you a bite of what the Lord's put in it back there yesterday. Get you a bite of it. It'll carry you on through till it shows up again. Thank God for the basket of what God has done and is a token of what he'll continue to do. The importance of considering the loaves. Let me ask you again in closing. Has God ever done anything for anybody in here good? Oh, boy. Oh, my. God is so good. God is so good. <laughs> and he'll continue. And he's good right now. And he'll continue to be so. Don't let your heart get hard. Please. Don't let your heart get hard. Keep it pliable and moldable. Don't get some bad thoughts in your mind about the Lord. Nothing bad about him. Don't get bad thoughts in your mind about the Lord's people. Don't even think bad about your enemy. Create a hard heart. Stay with God. Stay with God. Let's stand. Prepare for invitation, please. Lord.